the ghost of Bataan, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Arthur Wormuth, a one-man army with 116 kills by the Fat Electrician. I love me some military history. I really love military history. And not only just from the military aspect of it, but a historical standpoint. You learn from history. You learn from even the mistakes of history so that you can do better in the future. Or at the very least, you have a heading to go into the future, right? And it always makes me happy when I hear stories like this. Not that I've seen this yet, right? But hear about legends like this and things that I just never really learned about in school. Alas, let's get into this. Let me... (laughs) Let's not waste more of your time. I really am curious about this. If you were to ask me to name one person off the top of my head that should have been awarded the Medal of Honor but wasn't, it would be a toss-up between Jake McNasty McNeese uh-huh. and this guy. <laughs> Today we're talking about the one-man army, Arthur Wermuth, or as the Imperial Japanese Army referred to him, the Ghost of Bataan. This Fuck. video is brought to you by Operation Good Boy. It's an online subscription service that dog? every month will send you and your dog, dog. a care package. This month, me and dog. Mushu got a first aid kit for when we go on walks, a water bottle for when we go on walks, some dog poop picker-upper bags, Walk. some daily supplements for him, and a couple bags of his favorite treats, TREs, treats ready to eat. That's right cool. That's actually clever. I love that. Good job. <laughs> See, Mushu approves. If you're not really into online subscription boxes, you can also buy the treats, the supplements, or the gear individually over at OperationGoodBoy.com. And regardless of what you get, you're going to get 15% off when you use the discount code QUACK15. So go check them out. Thanks. Let's get back to the video. All right. That actually sounds kind of cool, actually. Not that I have dog, right? But that sounds kind of cool. Important background info, December 7th, 1941, Japan attacks America at Pearl Harbor. Okay, everybody knows what Pearl Harbor is, but what most people don't realize is that while Japan was attacking America, they were also simultaneously launching attacks on pretty much every other nation and island in the Pacific. Yeah. Hong Kong, Wake Island, Guam, Malaya, Singapore, Thailand, all of these nations and islands would fall to the Japanese within three months. All of them except for one the Philippines. If you don't know, at this point in time, the Philippines is actually a territory under the United States of America who had assumed control of the Philippines from Spain after Mm -hmm. the Spanish-American War in 1898. Because of that, there was already 22,000 soldiers there. Now, don't get me wrong, they weren't expecting to get attacked. The majority of these soldiers, 12,000 of them, are Mm -hmm. non-combat related jobs or they're Philippine. Oh no. Oh no. That's not going to save you. Unfortunately, that's not going to save you. You know, reservists. But that other 10,000 was the Philippine scouts. And I cannot stress to you enough that these guys are absolute gangsters. They were founded in 1901 by the U.S. Army. It is essentially Filipino and Filipino-American soldiers being led by American officers. And they are experts in guerrilla, anti-guerrilla, and jungle warfare. These are the guys that fought the... So absolute legends. Got it. No, and I think a lot of of U.S. history and... America, at least. At least what I went through in Idaho. But I mean, to be fair, we're, what, 48 out of 50 in terms of education. So (laughs) take that as you will. Like, we covered a lot of the European theater, but we really didn't cover the Pacific theater in, uh, in as much detail. Which always struck me as weird. Hands sung rebels during the Moral Rebellion. They are literally the men. You trained with them once. They're nutty. They sound nutty. That must have been an experience. That America's patron saint of hole punching, John Moses Browning, created the Colt 45 1911 4. They are the direct predecessor of the Philippines' current special forces, the Scout Rangers, and they are probably some of, if not the last people on the planet that you want to fight in the jungle. And one of the Americans... It's it's not even that they're like special forces tier for me. I mean, absolutely, that that helps. Like, I mean, I'm I'm a civilian. I have immense respect for anybody in a military because like... (laughs) I'm <laughs> not going to win. I, I'm an idiot on the internet, right? <laughs> but I mean, like, just to be up a level on... Oh my god, that's nutty. American officers leading these men is none other than Arthur Wermuth, son of a World War One veteran that grew up in Chicago. For high With school, the he right. Northwestern Military Academy. And after graduating from there, he would be denied by West Point because the only thing he excelled at in life was football and winning fist fights. His football coach said that defensively, he was a tough man to get through, and offensively, many points were scored through holes that he opened. Despite being what? rejected by West Point, he still wanted to be a... I mean, I guess you can get rejected by West Point, right? Because it's, it's like one of the most, if not the most prestigious military academy, right? I'm assuming slots are hard to find for that. And when they open up, it's going to be incredibly competitive. 
Like, it's a damn shame. Don't get me wrong. Like, fuck. A military officer. So he would go to college at Loyola University in Chicago, mm. where he would join the ROTC program and get his bachelor's degree in bacteriology, which would later become Legend. known as microbiology. Yeah. So after graduating from college and receiving his commission as a military officer, he would write the United States War Department requesting to get put on active duty. He would get accepted and sent over to the Philippines, where he would uh -huh. arrive in January of 1941 to train with the Philippine Scouts. Fast you have to walk on water to get in the military academy these days. I'd, I'd be very interested to understand the back end of that because, I mean, I think the obvious thing that a civilian could jump to is that there would be favoritism or favors would have to be pulled in exchange in order to get admitted to an academy. But I feel that's very dismissive. And I'd love to, like, I'll have to ask my Cav Scout buddy about that, actually. Oh, seg quick segue. So I was asking uh, the other day, I was having a discussion about OPSEC. And like, what happens if you're in a situation that you need to seek like uh, treatment for, like you know, therapy services and stuff like that, but you can't discuss what you went through or where you were at or anything about it because it's under OPSEC. So how does that get handled? And the answer that was we arrived to, well, my Cap Scout buddy arrived to through discussions he's had in the past, is that I guess so. In the, if in the immediate vicinity, anyone on that operation you were with, anything that anyone that you were with under OPSEC that they will be your go-to in order to discuss the events and try to work through that. If not, apparently the chaplain has certain security clearances and you can discuss the ca you can discuss it with the chaplain. I was unaware of this and I was like, "Huh. It, it's because <laughs> I always think of these weird niche interactions that like people will be like, I get it <laughs> scratch his head. I I mean, yeah, that's an interaction. I don't know what happens there." And so just I love finding answers to weird things like that. So, but yeah, no, apparently if it's under OPSEC, uh, obviously you want to make sure you're asking the relevant people, the people that were with you on that uh, excursion, on that uh, thing, whatever you did that is under OPSEC would be the first line of people to talk to. Second would apparently be the chaplain. And third, uh, probably talking to a senior officer or even VA personnel to figure out where you go from there. Just was, It's just interesting. So the chaplain that was either at the FOB or knows the unit, that one, important clarification. But yeah, no, it's just one of those things that like I wasn't aware of, and that's super interesting to think about. Uh, I think Ivy League College also having military requirements on top. Oof. Yeah, that's rough. The school system only glossed over the Pacific because of how nasty the Pacific was. Only equivalent would be Vietnam. Attention to the enemy. It was World War Asian... Oof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the Pacific Theater was not nice. Chaplains are cleared for everything since they legally qualify as priests. That is interesting. I, I know we totally derailed the video, but that was just an interesting interaction I came across in this past week, and really was interested to hear the answer to that. Fast forward eleven months later, the Japanese show up and they attack. Filipino and American forces are not ready. They are outmanned, outgunned in every conceivable way. At this point, mm -hmm. leadership decides their best bet is to pool all of their resources and have everybody move to the Bataan Peninsula. They are essentially going to back themselves into a corner, draw one line in the sand, and desperately try to hold that line long enough for American reinforcements to show up. Yeah, it's not I a mean, great plan, but it's pretty much the only thing they can do. And I mean, especially if you're backed into a corner, right? And obviously, I once going to have to clarify, because especially on the Wake Island, like I'm a civilian. I do not have the right or ability to truly speak on military affairs. Hindsight is 2020 as well. If you are in a situation where you are, there's an aggressor bearing on you. It is a valid tactic to engage in turtle strat. You turtle up and you draw that line, that line in the sand. Like you're saying that is a valid strategy. And I'm, it sounds like it was the best strategy they had at the time, but while they were waiting for backup, and if that wasn't bad enough, there's actually a problem with that. The Japanese are advancing so fast that they're going to be able to cut off the Route 2 baton before everybody can actually make it there. So now, mm -hmm. Arthur Wearmouth and the rest of the 57th Infantry Regiment are going to have to go and fight the Japanese on the front line, desperately trying to hold them off long enough for all the other people to retreat. General Wainwright gives them the order to dig in and hold, and that's exactly what Arthur and his men do. At this point, mm -hmm. Arthur is in command of Delta Company of the 57th Infantry Regiment, which is roughly 150 Philippine scouts. Mm -hmm. And for the next two weeks, they go toe to toe with the Japanese army, desperately trying to hold them off long enough for everybody else to retreat. This was how Arthur and his men would spend Christmas of 1941, dealing heavy losses to the enemy. But by New Year's, they had faced the same thing and endured heavy losses themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the first week of January 1942, Arthur's 150 men had dwindled down to just 37. At this point, that's rough. 
and that's that's the i mean we can see that on paper we can see that as statistics we can see it as numbers but it's more than numbers it's friends acquaintances comrades brothers you know sisters uh in mixed units right that you've fought alongside with and known for however long you could have known each other before going to the service you could have met each other in the service you could, one of them might have been a blue falcon right and you grow you grew into an understanding at some point right it's they were they're they're people and i think that's what's glossed over a lot it's one thing to say there were 150 you know soldiers here and now they were now th and they, they were now 37 but that from a logistical standpoint i understand why it's formatted as such they're they were still people and it's really tragic i don't know, I, I guess i have a different insight and perspective on that not saying that i've had to go through similar and i can't like say that i fully understand because i haven't had to go through that i empathize and it's a really shitty feeling or an empire used to, uh need to uh, use the turtle formation yes yes <laughs> there's your roman empire thought for the day yes the roman empire did use turtle formation to dig in it is a valid tactic so yeah. <laughs> when it became clear that they were not going to be able to hold the front line, at which point they were ordered to retreat back to Bataan. But mm. Arthur had a plan to slow down the Japanese even further. Uh -huh. Arthur volunteers to sneak back into a city that recently fell to the Japanese by himself because in that city there's a wooden bridge, and that wooden bridge is going to prove vital for the Japanese to quickly move troops. He's going to burn the bridge? And if Arthur can get rid of it, it is going to severely hamper their ability to do so. So. I mean, yeah. No, that's that, that tracks. If it is required for their troops to push through a specific area, a bridge, you take out the bridge, you take out the means of transportation. What are they going to have to do at that point? They need to fix the bridge. They need to create a new bridge. They need to ford that river in that place, which it does have its own issues and concerns, or they have to find another way around which to delay them. No, that's actually really fair. Oh, Arthur is going to sneak into the city by himself with demo charges, his Thompson submachine gun, and two five-gallon jugs of gasoline. He Hell is yeah. then going to make his way to Main Street under the cover of night, dump the gasoline all over the buildings, and light Main Street on fire. Once all the buildings in Main Street are engulfed in flames, that is a signal to the Philippine scouts miles away that they're going to start dropping artillery on that area. And oh. Arthur is going to use that as a distraction to make his way over to this bridge, place some demo charges, and blow it up. And that's pretty much that's brilliant there are stages to this plan on that earlier subject on statistics no war would have been fought if soldiers had been given phase instead of stats no fast way to turn a populace than given a name to a tragedy yeah it's unfortunate and i think more people just need to think about it in that way that it's not just statistics it's not just logistics it's not just a numbers game to certain people in certain departments yes i can see that being a valid way to relay information right you come across to a uh, an officer whose job is to ship mres maybe um to get supplies to certain areas right maybe that you know okay we are down this many troops you know we we need therefore we can adjust this right or amount of ammunition used mres etc et and especially from a civilian standpoint i think it is our prerogative it should be our goal to understand that it is not just numbers. These are not just faceless soldiers and troops. These are people. These were people. And they did what they thought was be best in, you know, going into the military and doing what they did. And it is unfortunate when anybody loses their life. And that, that I'm going to say this an overarching statement. You know, there are arguments for certain actions and certain people but we're not going to delve into that. That is a, it's a tragic loss when anybody loses their life. Asterisk is how I'm going to word that. So just a little two cents there in regards to understanding from, like learning from history, understanding history. And even if you're a civilian, trying to understand the implications, you know, just food for thought exactly what happens. Arthur sneaks into town, manages to light Main Street on fire, waits for the fire to grow a little bit, at mm -hmm. which point Arthur knows the artillery fire is coming right on top of him right. any second and he just has to make a run for this bridge. But this bridge is wide out in the open right next to Main Street mm -hmm. and he is about to run essentially down Main Street towards a bridge that's being guarded and there is hundreds of Japanese soldiers everywhere. All right. Jeez, I do agree, chat. Yeah, talk about setting Main Street on fire. That seems easy enough. 
Thankfully, most of them are distracted by the fact that most of Main Street is on fire, and not yeah. a lot of them take notice of the fact that there is now a 190-pound American sprinting down Main Street yeah. towards the bridge. But yeah. eventually, a couple of them would take notice and begin firing at Arthur, and he would be struck in the calf and fall to the ground. Fuck. And right then is when the artillery rounds started dropping. Jeez. And as soon as the artillery rounds started dropping, Arthur waited there for a second, and then when he thought they were all distracted again, he got up and continued to run towards the bridge. He got struck in the cow. He is still going. This man is built different. He then proceeded to place the demolition charges, blowing up the bridge before disappearing back in the jungle and making his way back to his men. So uh -huh. Arthur and his men make it to Bataan. At this point, you have to put yourself in Arthur's shoes. He is one of the highest ranking officers on the ground. He was just in charge of 150 men two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and only 37 of them survived. That's not necessarily his fault. He was no. placed in a completely unwinnable situation, but ultimately he's not going to feel great about himself losing that many of his men. He's been living in the Philippines. Right, and that's the thing is like especially if you're put into an unwinnable situation, right? You can only do the best with what you're given, and sometimes maybe that's the wrong decision. Right. And and that's why hindsight's 2020. It's, you know, why people can talk about things decades. Oh, well, this was the, you know, statistically wrong call. This was, you know, the wrong call from what they did. And yeah, hindsight's 2020. You he's doing the best that he can with the situation he has been given, with the hand he's been dealt. Philippines for almost a year, training with the Philippine scouts. He's an expert in camouflage, an Jesus. expert in jungle warfare, and an expert in guerrilla warfare tactics. And he decides that rather than lose any more of his men, he is gonna go out past the front line into enemy territory by himself and terrorize the enemy. So that's what he does. Yeah. He sleeps during the day and every night he grabs his Thompson submachine gun, two Colt 45 1911s, and a bunch of- Hell yeah. Not just one, he's rocking two 1911s. <laughs> ...grenades and heads off into the jungle by himself to utilize hit and run tactics against the Japanese yeah. conducting guerrilla warfare. And on one of these missions, he's a couple miles into enemy territory from the front line when he hears a bunch of Japanese soldiers coming up on him. So he uh -huh. quickly hides in some bushes and camouflages himself and 30 Japanese soldiers, an entire platoon, comes walking past. One of them almost steps on him, uh -huh. and he's just laying there dead quiet, trying not to breathe, and the troops are making their way towards the front line. And Arthur knows he has to do something because they're either going to launch an attack or they're getting reconnaissance to scout the front line. Either right. way, these guys got to go. He knows that even if he pops up with the element of surprise from behind them with his Thompson submachine gun, he's still going to lose that firefight. So Right, no, he, he it's just a numbers game at that point. They have more people and more bullets trained on him he might have a second or two at most right to get you know get launch a surprise attack that is a interest i'm curious how he gets out of this i'm very curious oh he does the only thing he can think to do and that is to get up and start walking in the column with these guys as oh my if god he was one of them so he's huh. literally following in this <laughs> no dude <laughs> the absolute giga chad energy oh my god the, the as a boomer like me would say the absolute balls on this man this japanese column walking through the jungle towards the front line at which point he decides hey i gotta make sure these guys don't look back and actually try to get a look at me because i'm wearing a different uniform they're gonna notice so there is one imposter among us oh my god he decides that every time one of them steps on a twig or makes a noise he's gonna shh so they be more quiet. Just oh my god! Like, oh, that's obviously not an enemy. Behind. Oh my god! No! Oh, that's so beautiful though, because he's pinning off the blame onto uh, he's pinning the blame and fear of being suspect on the others. Oh my god! Oh, this is perfect. I live for this shit. Behind me, it's somebody trying to get me to be quiet because they're on my side. Arthur Wermuth has just switched gears from John Rambo <laughs> to Bugs Bunny fucking with Elmer Fudd. And he follows these guys through the jungle for miles, just shushing them the entire way. And then when they finally get up to the front line, Arthur knows that he has to do something. He has to alert his guys that they're about to attack. So he does uh -huh. the only thing he could think to do. He quietly pulls the pin from one of his grenades and then acts like he tripped on something, stumbling to the man in front of him, grabbing a hold of him for balance. And when he grabs a hold of him, he wow. hands the grenade to him right in the guy's chest. That guy obviously grabs it and Arthur runs off into the jungle. The Japanese <laughs> soldier's like, wait. <laughs> he's gonna get the kill and he's gonna fucking vent. <laughs> 
No fucking way. What? Oh god. Boom! He blows up. Then Arthur turns around with his Thompson and opens fire on the rest of them. Yeah. This obviously alerts his men and they start opening fire too. They completely wipe out this Japanese yeah. platoon. After this and other events like it, the Japanese start to fear Arthur, referring to him as the ghost of Bataan, while the American forces are referring to him as the one man army. At this what was the conversation like though? I need to know. What him and his 36 other men, what is that conversation? Just boom, you see fire coming from in one direction right and you see this column of japanese troops just like sir what are you doing because he's the highest ranking out of them right like it's just someone just like oh sir what are we doing here what, are you, what why are you out there <laughs> or is it just like or is it like the it's the damn cbs vibe like it is which one of these is it <laughs> I would love to have known what that conversation was. At this point, he gets his notoriety and other experienced Filipino scouts start volunteering to go out with him, yeah. but he doesn't want to lose any more men, so he keeps refusing and he keeps refusing. And finally, there's one brave Filipino scout that he can't refuse because this guy will kick his ass. Yeah. His name is Sergeant Crispin Jacob, AKA Jock. He is described as being six foot four, 220 pounds. And Jacked. Arthur Ramos himself said that he is half Filipino, half Oriental giant. And he begins Fuck. going out on these missions with Arthur. And time after time, Jock manages to save Captain Wermuth's life. At some point, it becomes apparent that the Japanese are intercepting frontline communications. But uh -huh. here's the thing. These communications aren't done over radio. They can't just be intercepted wirelessly. Uh -huh. These are hardwired communications with a physical wire just strung out on the ground. Uh -huh. This means that somewhere along that wire, the Japanese have tapped into it physically. Uh -huh. And Arthur Wermuth and Jock are sent out at night to investigate. So they're tracing mm -hmm. this wire down all night long. Long, just following this wire, following this wire, and at some point in the darkness, they lose track of it. So right. they're trying to refine where the wire went. They're looking, they're looking. Arthur gets his legs tangled up in a vine and he falls down. No big deal. He pulls out his knife, goes to cut the vine. Oh shit, wait, hold on. This is the wire. At which point he looks oh, over oh, to yell oh. at Jock, like, hey, I found it. And he looks, and there is a ditch with a Japanese soldier and a bunch of equipment sitting in it, looking at him like he's dumbfounded. Arthur, <laughs> quick. <laughs> Just like, just like, what the <laughs> No fucking way. <laughs> Sorry, give me a second. This is, I, this is killing my fucking model. I don't know what the fuck is going on. God, that's funny though. <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> no, no, no fucking way. Oh my God. That is, that is some bullshit. <laughs> Oh my god, I hope the software actually starts working again soon, because it's killing me. He draws his gun as the Japanese soldier draws his, and they have a good old-fashioned quick draw contest, yeah. which Arthur wins. Arthur, wow. then quickly making it back to his feet, is then tackled by two Japanese soldiers into the ditch, one of them stabbing him with a bayonet through his arm, pinning him to the dirt wall Fuck. inside of this trench, That's rough. at which point he yells for Jock. Jock then runs up to the edge of the trench and sees Wermuth inside the trench, fighting off two Japanese soldiers with his arm pinned to the wall, he takes aim with his rifle at the Japanese soldiers and then realizes that he doesn't want to accidentally hit Wermuth in no. the middle of the fight while it's still dark out. So He's gonna he jumps him. in the trench and proceeds to beat the two Japanese soldiers to death with his rifle. He then Jeez. destroys the radio equipment, helps Wermuth pull the bayonet out of his arm. He starts bleeding everywhere. He yeah. bandages that up Arteries and gets hit. Wermuth back to the hospital, at which point the ghost of Bataan is now bedridden and on doctor's orders is not allowed to leave. And while right. all that's going on, word finally makes it back to America that there's some crazy crazy 190 pound ex football player running around in the jungles of the Philippines showing the Japanese what's up. And this is the one shining piece of good news that America clings on to in the days after Pearl Harbor. Arthur mm. Wermuth unknowingly becomes an overnight celebrity in America. He is taking up all the headlines. They are making comic books about him and his partner Jock. He is mm -hmm. inside of bubblegum packets telling huh. the story of them finding the tap in the communication line. Arthur Wermuth is now one of the first main characters in World War II fighting for America, and he is vital for overall American morale. Mm -hmm. And just like a main character, he decides that he's not going to stay bedridden. He violates doctor's orders, checks himself out of the hospital, and gets back in the fight. At this point, the Japanese have flooded the entire surrounding area with snipers that are picking off American and Filipino soldiers day and night. Right. And Arthur Wermuth has to be the man that does something 
something about it. But considering that there's so many of them and that Jock just saved his life, he comes to the conclusion that having some friends around isn't exactly a bad idea. No. So he starts taking volunteers to join his special anti-sniper unit and 84 of the meanest, most experienced Philippine scouts volunteered. Not only were these guys counter sniping the snipers, there was also <laughs> a bunch of them out in the jungle, camouflaged and hidden, waiting for the sniper to fire so they knew where he was, and then they were gonna come at him with machetes and Colt 45s. Thru Jesus Christ, oh my God. February and March of 1942, Arthur Wermuth, Jock, and their anti-sniper unit were credited with taking out 500 Japanese soldiers, and this is considered to be a very conservative estimate. Naughty. Then in late March, command would ask for volunteers to do a nearly impossible mission of recapturing the high point of Mount Pukat, at which point Arthur immediately volunteered and then asked his men who of them would also like to volunteer, uh -huh. and they all did. Arthur and his men then set off to try to... A good leader is worth their weight in gold, like... To inspire people to just like, ever, no, there's just not a single person there that's going to say no. Insane. Complete this nearly impossible mission. It is a 36 hour hike through enemy territory just to get to the objective. Along that 36 hour hike, they are credited with taking out an additional 65 Japanese soldiers. Jeez. Then upon reaching Mount Pukat, they would launch an attack and it would fail, Arthur would lose over half of his men. Having Fuck. failed to take the high ground at Mount Pukat, Arthur and his surviving men would retreat back to Bataan. Along the way, they would get ambushed by a machine gun position, and Arthur would be struck in the chest with machine gun fire. Damn. Arthur would then wake up in a field hospital back at Bataan, where he was informed that the bullet went through his rib into his lung, and he was now battling an infection. I would Fuck. assume they didn't have antibiotics to give him, because at this point, Bataan was in rough shape. They were down yeah. to half rations, and they were running out of every supply imaginable. Desperately trying right and that's yeah because they're still waiting on backup and i mean this is this sounds like early pacific theater especially if th this is really the first bit of good news since pearl harbor like from military history and historical standpoint right like this is early early pacific theater yeah they're, they're waiting a hot minute hold out long enough to get resupplied and reinforced arthur would remain in the hospital for 10 days and every single day that passed it became more and more apparent that they were losing and Japan was going to win. At this mm. point, Arthur, against doctor's orders, with pus oozing from his chest, still Jeez. battling an infection, would don his gear and go back out with his men one last time. Arthur and his anti-sniper unit desperately tried to hold the line against the Japanese, but due to sheer overwhelming numbers, they were beaten back over and over again. And during one of their retreats on April 9th, Arthur would slip down the side of a cliff, smacking his head on a rock, rendered unconscious. Fuck. He would again wake up in the hospital, but this time when he awoke, he would come to find out that the Japanese had completely taken over Bataan, the Americans had been forced to surrender, and General MacArthur had fled to Australia. This Wait, is absolutely what? the worst possible- Wait. He's an American general. Wait, why? What? I feel like I vaguely remember this. That's not nothing, though. I need to, I, I've off to deep dive. I need to figure out what happened to him after that. Cause like, isn't that deserting your post? I, I don't, I don't know. Like that's the, I don't know how that'd be handled. That's not an insignificant action though. Military court is scary. <laughs> possible outcome because the Imperial Japanese believe that if you surrender in battle, you lose your honor. And if you lose your honor, you are no longer human. You were subhuman and no longer. He was ordered by the president to leave. Okay. So it's not like he was a wall. He was ordered to get out of there. Probably a important enough person from a general, right? Important enough position that him being alive was more beneficial than not or being captured. Okay. Uh, I can't speak to the incompetency and idiocy of McCarthy. I don't have enough there, honestly. Retreating is a feat. Interesting. I'm going to have to look into that because that's interesting. Longer eligible for human rights, which gives them the justification to treat you however they want. Arthur Wermuth is bedridden, having been shot in the leg, stabbed in the arm with a bayonet, shot in the chest, concussed, uh -huh. and battling an infection. And he is probably one of the luckiest men there. Because pretty much everybody else is forced to participate in the Bataan Death March. And I don't really want to get too far into what that is and what happened, but suffice it to say, over 30% of everybody else is going to die in captivity as a prisoner Fuck. of war. And if Arthur Wormuth were also forced to go down the Bataan Death March, he would absolutely be a member of that 30% given his current condition. I can't verify this for sure, but I think the reason that they let Arthur Wormuth have a chance at surviving is because technically he never surrendered. He was fatally wounded in battle, mm -hmm. and when he woke up, he had already been captured, 
So yeah. I think that maybe the Japanese didn't look down on him as subhuman because he didn't forfeit his honor. He literally fought until he lost consciousness. And by sheer luck, he survived and woke up in captivity. Mm. After making his recovery, now Major Weremouth would find himself being the highest ranking military officer around, making him the leader of the few remaining Americans that were lucky enough to escape the Bataan Death March. Mm -hmm. And for the next year, they are used as forced labor to build Japanese airstrips. One of the Americans under the command of Arthur was a man by the name of Elliot Smessler, who later on in life would write a book of memoirs about his time as a prisoner of war under the mm -hmm. Japanese. In that book, he wrote this, quote, the first year of my captivity, I worked on building an airfield for the Japanese. Life wasn't bad because they were afraid of the major in charge. His name was Major Wehrmuth, and the Japanese called him Wehrmuth the Lion. Oh my god. <laughs> That's insane to think about, actually. Oh, wow. Now, I think this is actually further evidence that the Japanese don't believe that he actually surrendered and didn't lose his honor in battle because they are still scared of him despite the fact that he is their prisoner. And he definitely didn't surrender because while... You, you are our prisoner. We're still aware of the feats that you've done. We have a very healthy respect for that. Arthur and the men under his command did build the airstrip they were told to build. They sabotaged it so that the concrete would buckle underneath the weight of Japanese heavy Amazing. bombers. Not only damaging the airstrip, but the bombers as well. Yeah, d Even in captivity, Wormuth still, still has fangs. That's the one. <laughs> Despite being a POW for over a year, Arthur and the men under his command are still finding a way to slow down the Japanese military. Mm -hmm. Because of this, Arthur and the men under his command are sent to live on a hell ship known as the Oryoku Maru, which if you don't know, a hell ship is essentially a POW camp on a boat and oh. they are infamous for their horrific living conditions. The Fuck. only thing worse than being a starving POW is being a starving POW on a boat with no shade while you're seasick. Then on January 9th, 1945, the USS Hornet, an American aircraft carrier, would mistake the hell ship for a troop transport and bomb it. This bombing would kill over 250 Americans instantly, wounding wow. and injuring almost every other American on board, including Arthur Wehrman. Despite having his wounds go untreated while starving to death, Arthur still somehow managed to survive, making it to Japan to be inside of a POW camp. Yeah, that's... Well, and that's, that's going to weigh on the pilot's consciousness, right? Especially if later the pilot learns, yeah, that was a POW ship. Like, that's going to eat at him for years. There, where he would later be freed after Japan surrendered. When Arthur Wehrmuth shipped off from America to the Philippines in 1941, he weighed 190 pounds. When he finally got to return home to America after World War II, he weighed only 105. He would then be wow. awarded four Purple Hearts, the Silver Star, and the Distinguished Service Cross. He is credited with 116 kills and will go down in history as the one-man army of Bataan. Yeah. Despite this, he credited his men, saying that 90% of what he was able to accomplish was due to the Philippine scouts and that they were the best soldiers in the world. So in conclusion, the fall of Wake Island in the Philippines are considered to be some of the first losses dealt to America during World War II. But in many ways, they were also some of the first victories. As stories of heroes like that of Hank Elrod and the Marines of Wake Island and Arthur Wehrmuth and his Philippine scouts reached the rest of the world, it would become clear to America that this war was winnable and it would become clear to Japan that they had a- Is there some audio? Okay, it's not me. There's some audio going on with the outro. fight on their hands than they ever anticipated. Some crackling. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go check out thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang. Out. Yeah, there's like this weird little like popping. I can't describe it. That's not me. It could just be the file. It could be the it could be the playback too. That was an incredible story actually. That's that's nutty. And that's I mean, as I said, at least in Idaho, it really, we really didn't learn much about the Pacific theater. And so this is just another side of a conflict for military history and history in general, right? World history that I've never really delved into. And, you know, it's just interesting to hear about these and the fact that, you know, it isn't really discussed or talked about like, and don't get me wrong. I get it. I, there's only so much you can knowing teachers. There's only so much you can fit into a curriculum, right? Well, why didn't we ever learn about Wake Island? Why didn't we ever learn about, you know, Sergeant Reckless, right? There's only so much that teachers can fit into a course with really strict time constraints. And even then you have to make sure that the kids are even, you know, retaining this stuff. So it's good to see stories like these get pushed. It's good to see stories like these that, aren't forgotten because there really is two deaths. One is your physical body. The second is when people forget who you are and that you even existed. But 
What do you think? What do you think about uh, Arthur, Arthur Wormuth? And I apologize about the mispronunciation in the beginning. What do you think about the... Uh, I can't really say think about the situation because that'll that'll evolve into... I'm trying to be apolitical. Let's put it that way. Uh, have you trained with the... Uh, the the scouts mentioned in this, or at least the modern iteration of them. You know, what are your uh, 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 any historical facts that you'd like to share? I, I'm really I can't really say what are your thoughts because I don't want an unregulated YouTube comment section of a military conflict. But I think a lot like most everybody, like 99.9% .9 of people, are super legit in the comment sections. And thank you all for coming on. I definitely appreciate that. You know, what are you thinking about uh, Fat Electrician covering all these events as well? If you haven't checked fat electrician out this is your first fat electrician video for some reason if you've seen me before seeing fat electrician definitely go check out the fat electrician he puts out amazing content definitely go check out and support this video and yeah that's all i got for you today see you in the next one